tonight I'm finishing up my portion of teaching in the series, Why, believe, Why We Believe What We Believe. Tonight is about affirmation of faith number 16, uh, as has been our custom. If we could get that up there on the screen, and if you would all stand and read it with me. This is a pretty short one. All right, ready? We believe that divine healing is obtained on the basis of the atonement. Thank you. You may be seated. See our scripture verses up there, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, and Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. I'll cover both of those as I talk tonight. Uh, when most people speak about the atonement, a lot of times the conversation revolves around um, the position of unlimited atonement or limited atonement, and um, the idea being that there's just a select group of people that Jesus' sacrifice was made for, and uh, the other end of the spectrum being that it's enough for everyone to be saved. As you can tell by this affirmation of faith, that's not what we're talking about in regards to the atonement. We're dealing with it in the context of healing. We believe and teach that healing is possible and obtainable by what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, and so that's what I'll be talking about primarily this evening. I'm hoping to show you just how comprehensive the atonement is. All right, I will read these two verses to you even though I'll discuss them later. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, kind of breaks in in the middle of this discourse where Peter's talking about Jesus, but it says, "...who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed." And then the next passage is Matthew eight seventeen, "...that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses." The last part of this verse from Matthew is a quote from Isaiah chapter 53, which is where we're going to be spending some time. We're actually going to begin in Isaiah 52. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, we'll have the verses up on the screen uh, as we usually do. I typically teach on this when I teach about healing. This is one of the messages the Lord spoke to me several years ago and told me basically to keep five messages on healing at the ready. And as I went to different places, he would tell me which one I'm to speak on. And so this is one of, the, one of those five. It's the in, underpinning, I believe, uh, of a good theology of healing. And so we're going to begin reading. Uh, I'm going to read about 15 verses that begin in chapter 52 of Isaiah and move into chapter 53. I'm going to begin in verse 13 of Isaiah 52. And it says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Verse 1 of chapter 53, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed." 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Most biblical scholars identify the servant of Isaiah 53 with Jesus Christ. Now that may seem, you might go, well, duh, right? But you should understand that Jewish tradition doesn't believe that this was Jesus. Jewish tradition holds to that it was Moses. Now you say, well, why should I care about that? Well, if you ever plan on leading any Jews to the Lord, you may have to deal with this passage, okay? Others have put forth the argument that the suffering servant is Israel corporate. Some have said Jeremiah, some have said Josiah, some have said Jehoiachin. It's not uncommon that people miss the idea that the servant being discussed is in fact the Lord. When people make up their minds about who Jesus is or who Jesus isn't, they can miss all kinds of things. I have a friend who is Jewish, and she's always jesting with me because I bring up Jesus all the time, and she just kind of laughs about it, right? So she already has this perception in her mind about uh, who Jesus is. And I tell her all the time that Jesus is my favorite Jew and she's my second favorite Jew. So she laughs at that too. It's also why I say as Christians, we're not entitled to our own opinion. You have to read the word and you have to let the word declare for you what the truth is. And you have to believe it and then you have to follow it regardless of your personal opinion. People get into trouble when they allow their opinions and their experiences to form their doctrine or their theology. Here's why, in part, Jewish tradition carries the suffering servant as Moses. The Jews of Jesus' time, and even before that, would have, would have had no comprehension whatsoever that the Messiah would endure suffering. There would be an idea maybe that Israel corporately would endure suffering because Israel had a history of getting themselves into sin, and we know that sin has consequences, and Israel suffered consequences all through their history. But they would have never considered that their Messiah would be one who would come and suffer. To him, the Messiah would have been a conquering hero. What did they repeatedly ask Jesus as he walked around with them? You know, are you going to restore the kingdom to us at this time? Is this when you're going to inaugurate the kingdom of God? When are you, basic, when are you basically taking over and freeing us from this oppression? So to them, the Messiah was a warrior who saves them from oppression and tyranny and is victorious. They would have never considered the idea where their hero is beaten and afflicted and spit upon and had his beard pulled out 
and all those things, and that that would be the way he obtained victory. Think of what, what many of you saw in the movie The Passion of the Christ this past weekend. As the Jews waited for the Messiah to be revealed, what happened in that movie or what was portrayed in the movie, that, that would have been the farthest thing from their thought process as to, hey, that's what our Messiah looks like. We know from history that when the first century Christians started to attribute this suffering servant picture to Jesus, the idea that he was the Messiah and all that, this was part of the reason the Jews had such a problem with that idea. I mean, what do you mean that our national hero is this guy who was beaten and mistreated and killed? That doesn't make sense. Now, we can have confidence that Jesus was this person. We have, the, we have the benefit of history. We get to look back. We get to see things from the future. It's a little bit easier for us. Uh, but this is what we're going to be talking tonight about. Now, there's a lot of things in those verses I read that are, that are sad. They're doom and gloom, basically. But I want you to notice how it started, and that goes back to verse 13 of chapter 52. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. So before any of that negative stuff is talked about, what's laid out first is that this, this suffering servant, this Jesus, is going to be victorious. Never have any doubt that the Lord has triumphed over everything. Now, we can clearly see from our standpoint in the future how God's plan and how the victory that God had planned was achieved. It makes sense to us in this world, but to the first century world, it was a radical, radical suggestion. As Isaiah 52 tells us, his beating was brutal. His visage was marred more than any man. In other words, he was beaten so badly he was unrecognizable, maybe even to the point where he didn't look human anymore. Think about that. So even as ghastly as those scenes were from the movie this past weekend, they really don't express what actually happened. You could still tell who that guy was, right? I love the next line that follows this description. It says, so shall he sprinkle many nations. It's as if with every blow that he received, as, as his blood would splatter like it would at a crime scene, that each one of those droplets of blood were taken into account for the nations. They would make atonement for those nations. And as we enter Isaiah 53, we get some of the most critical language, I think, in the whole of Scripture about the Lord Jesus and what his death accomplishes. And I, I believe a case could be made that this chapter of the Bible contains the perfect summary of how Christianity and Christian doctrine are distinguished from any other religion in existence, past, present, or future. Here's why. No other system of belief, no other system of belief has their central figure treated in such a way. All religions are not the same. They do not lead everyone to heaven. It's only Christianity. The first verse of Isaiah 53 kind of affirms this for us. Who has believed our report? Who would believe that the model for salvation and victory and eternal glory involved what Jesus went through? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord is a phrase used throughout the Bible to express God's strength, and the relative ease with which he demonstrates his power and victory, right? All throughout the Old Testament, the arm of the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt. The arm of the Lord accomplished this. The arm of the Lord accomplishes that. 
Who would believe in watching Jesus get beaten almost to death? Who would say, man, look at that. That's the strength of God on display right there. Who would believe that that is how victory is won? Who would believe that the man who had his face mangled with violence would be the same one who secures a glorious, triumphant victory? The verses go on to say that Jesus would grow up as a tender plant. A tender plant is one that is weak and is vulnerable. This too should not surprise us. What Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So even as Jesus was displayed his weakness, and through all he went through, the strength of God was being revealed. I also think that this language of a tender plant describes the character of Jesus. He was tender and compassionate. He wasn't rough and tough with people. The scripture says he was a root out of dry ground. How many of you spend time trying to plant things in soil that is dry and no good? Nobody does, right? But that didn't stop the Lord. Jesus came up in dry ground. In other words, he had no advantages. He had no advantages. He has no form or comeliness, no beauty that we should desire him. So his looks were not an advantage to him. He looked like everybody else. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. He is despised and rejected. He's still despised and rejected. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now most of us, if, it, if we have sorrows, it's because we feel sorry for ourselves, right? I don't believe that Jesus ever felt sorry for himself. I don't believe that he ever got depressed. But I do believe that he felt very sorry for everyone else. I think he realized just the depravity of the fallen condition of man that was evident everywhere around him and everywhere he looked. And we hid our faces from him and he was despised and we did not esteem him. So because he wasn't anything fancy, and because he didn't stand out in a crowd, and there was nothing wild or charismatic about him, mankind's general response to him was to ignore him and despise him. Because it's true that men value what they see. They look at the outward, but God looks at the heart. Now, I don't have time to go through the rest of the chapter line by line, but I want to move over to Matthew chapter 8 because it's going to help us expound Isaiah chapter 53. What's happening in Matthew chapter 8? In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus has more or less just finished his Sermon on the Mount. He's come down from the mountain, and he goes on this healing bonanza. Right from the beginning of chapter 8 right through to the end, Everyone who comes to Jesus that has any kind of ailment or issue, he heals them all. I'm going to read verses 16 and 17 from Matthew 8. It says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Okay, so verse 17, there's our verse from our affirmation of faith. And it's a quote from Isaiah 53. But from the beginning of chapter 8 in Matthew, the Lord heals a leper. Then he heals the centurion's servant who is paralyzed with some sort of affliction. Then he goes to Peter's mother-in-law's house, and she is sick with fever, and she, he heals her. Then you have those two verses that I just read. And so the writer of Matthew ties Jesus directly to the suffering servant by illustrating all those people that he healed and then by saying uh, 
that quote from Isaiah 53. So that connection is made for us very clearly. Uh, that's probably the clearest passage in the New Testament that shows that Jesus is the suffering servant. Not to mention Jesus' ministry in this chapter validates his Messiahship and the authority that he's been given. But let's look at verse 17. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. The word for bore is a Greek word, bastazo. It means to take up with the hands, to take up in order to carry or bear, to put upon one's self something to be carried, to bear what is burdensome, to bear, to carry, to carry on one's person, to sustain, i.e. to uphold, to support, to bear away, and to carry off. So this verse essentially says that the suffering servant will take our infirmities and carry away our sicknesses. And this next part is truly fascinating. When you look up what the Greek words are for infirmities and sicknesses, do you know what they mean? Nobody knows. They mean infirmities and sicknesses. In the case of infirmities, they can be infirmities of the body or the soul. And in the case of sickness, it's physical sickness and disease. Now, we know what physical sickness and disease are, but what's an infirmity? An infirmity is a physical or mental weakness or the condition of being feeble. Synonyms are ailment. Bug, complaint, complication, condition, disease, disorder, distemper, fever, illness, malady, sickness, or trouble. When I teach on healing, I often ask the congregation who has something they need to be healed of. What happens when you ask a congregation who has something they need to be healed of? How many people raise their hands? You all say lots. In an average church, like two people put their hand up, right? When a pastor asks a room of 75 people who has something they need to be healed of and only two people raise their hands, I know everybody else is lying. (laughs) And I love that we laugh, but we all carry this perception that God is not interested in our total well-being. Do you know that it's God's desire for you that you live in abundant health and abundant life? A lot of people don't know that. Or a lot of people don't believe that. The normal conditioned reaction of the church is, yeah, I mean, I guess so, right? God doesn't guess so, right? People really don't believe in large measure that God desires abundant health and abundant life for them. When a pastor asks people if they need healing, this is what most people do. They assess whatever they're dealing with, and they put it through a little litmus test. Should I bother the Lord with this? Right? Well, I mean, I don't need to ask for prayer for my knee. I mean, after all, I can walk. Sure, I've been limping for three years, but I mean, I make it around all right. Right? People justify that stuff all the time. I'm just as guilty. I got a bum elbow. From all the work I've been doing, my elbow is killing me. I can barely hold my coffee cup in the morning. It's starting to tick me off. But it hasn't ticked me off to the point where I've come in and said, hey, church, I need some people to lay hands on and pray for my elbow. Right? Because we just get content with what we carry around. You know, if, they, if people have cancer, they go, well, I'm going to ask for prayer for that because that could take my life. That bothers me. But the sore knee, nah, 
Why, borrow, why, why bother the good master with a sore knee? It only bothers me six days out of seven. On the seventh day, it stops, so I get a day of rest. What's the big deal? The deal is, cue, cue the series on abundance, it's a poverty mindset. You've conditioned yourself or, or the, you know, whatever has conditioned you to accept the less than of what he has for your life. It's poverty. You know, poverty is not just about the wealth stuff. It's about all these little things that we settle for less than what God has said is available to us, and we become indifferent. You know, I think it's just the devil doesn't have to get you to outright rebel. He just gets you to be indifferent. And you settle. And you say, ah, it's not a big deal. It's not hurting me enough yet. It's amazing to me that when we're sick, the first place we choose to stay home from is church. Right? When we need a day of rest, the first place we decide we're going to take a rest from is the house of God. You know why? Because we can blow off church and that doesn't affect the rest of our life. But if we blow off other stuff, well, that could be a bigger deal. I'm meddling now. But the very place that would bring us or should bring us into the company of belief and an atmosphere of healing and a refreshing and a rejuvenating of our soul is the very place we decide we don't need to go. If we're sick or if we're tired, we stay home. And we've got it backwards. And until we start believing and living in the reality of a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered gospel, we're going to continue to float through life, feeling bad, trying to manage our own infirmities, not wanting to bother the good master. And i got to tell you, if I'm Jesus, I feel cheated. Because if I'm Jesus, I took that beating to deal with all of that, and you can't be bothered. Well, what did I get beat for? God told me, if I'm the Lord, that I'm supposed to bear up and carry away the infirmities of my people. But they would rather hang on to them themselves. I don't get it. Okay. Dead rabbit. Plain reading of these verses conveys the idea that, number one, Jesus is the suffering servant, and number two, he will heal us of our infirmity, sickness, and diseases. Now, those of us that are Pentecostal in the background, we point to the turn of the century. Uh, the turn of the 20th century is when Pentecostalism began to be revived. We like to talk about Azusa Street and revival and pouring out of the Spirit and speaking in tongues and all those kind of things. We're so proud of that, all of our roots there. Interestingly enough, the roots of the modern healing movement in America are not Pentecostal in origin. They are Baptist in origin. So here's a little modern history lesson for you. If you study healing through the ages since the first century, there's no doubt that there was a significant downturn in both conversions to Christ and the supernatural in terms of healing, but it did not dissipate through the ages. But a resurgence began in healing at the turn of the 20th century. A prominent figure of that was a guy named A.J. Gordon. Anybody ever heard of A.J. Gordon? Several people have heard of A.J. Gordon. His full name was Adoniram Judson Gordon. Now, you know why they called him A.J. He is the one that wrote the song that a lot of us love to sing, My Jesus, I love thee. I know that thou art mine. He's got to sing it for you, but I'm a joyful noiser, not a singer. Right? Everybody know that song? Okay. He was born in 1836. He got saved at 15. He was determined to be a pastor. He wrote that song, My Jesus, I Love Thee, at 16 years old. He went to Brown University and became a Baptist pastor. Brown at that time was a Baptist school. He, became, he began pastoring, and at 33 years of age, he became the pastor of Clarendon Street Baptist Church in Boston in 1869. 
His church was described as one of the most spiritually aggressive churches in America at the time. He was a frequent guest speaker for D.L. Moody at Moody's Conventions, and he went on to found Gordon College and Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Massachusetts. He ended up writing 15 hymns, and he wrote a book on the Holy Spirit. This is what he said about being filled with the Spirit. He said, it seems clear from the scriptures that it is still the duty and privilege of believers to receive the Holy Spirit by a conscious, definite act of appropriating faith just as they received Jesus Christ. Come on, AJ. Gordon believed that healing was available in the atonement, and he wrote a book called The Ministry of Healing that was very influential to Pentecostal circles back in that time. Interestingly enough, for being a very aggressive spiritual church, A.J. Gordon didn't pray for healing for people publicly. He always did it privately. He never even incorporated any type of opportunity for healing in his services. It's also interesting that at age 59, he contracted bronchitis and the flu, and he died very quickly. But this is what he said about Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 to 17. He said, these verses are a deep and suggestive truth that we have Christ set before us as the sickness bearer as well as the sin bearer of his people. Something more than sympathetic fellowship with our sufferings is evidently referred to here. The yoke of his cross by which he lifted our iniquities took hold also of our diseases so that it is in some sense true that as God made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, so he made him to be sick for us, who knew no sickness. In other words, the passage seems to teach that Christ endured vicariously our diseases as well as our iniquities. Next we have the book of Luke, chapter 22. The Last Supper is over. Jesus and company are headed to the Mount of Olives. And they're gathering their things, and the Lord says this to them in verse 37. He says, For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So here the Lord Jesus identifies himself as the suffering servant by quoting verse 12 of Isaiah 53. Likewise, we have in Acts 8... You're all probably familiar with Philip the Evangelist catching up to the Ethiopian in the chariot. I'm going to read a few verses from that, beginning in verse 26. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. So the Ethiopian official is reading Isaiah 53, verse 7. When he encounters Philip, Philip identifies this suffering servant as Jesus Christ, as recorded again by Luke. And then you have the other verse from our affirmation of faith, 1 Peter chapter 2. We have the apostle Peter corresponding with people who are slaves themselves, enduring suffering, and Peter links Christ with the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. This is what Peter writes, beginning in verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongly. 
For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his, his steps. Verse 22, who, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth? who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So I think we've definitively linked Jesus and the suffering servant from Isaiah 53. Would you agree? All right, now let's look at some of the original Hebrew language from Isaiah 53. You guys know I like to examine these words. Uh, You know, it's just too many circumstances where the English language does not adequately convey the meaning of what is being said. So let's go back to verse 4 of Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs. This word griefs here in verse 4 is a prime example. When we see griefs, what would we say griefs is? Emotion. We associate griefs with what we know grief to mean. Things like sadness, depression, sorrow. In the Hebrew... This is not what this word means. The Hebrew word behind griefs is koli. In 50% of its uses in Scripture, it means sickness. In another 19%, it means disease. So in 69% of its uses throughout the Old Testament, it means sickness or disease, not sadness. The next verse out there talks about sorrows. When we move on to sorrows, the Hebrew word is makov. That word means sorrow or pain. And the pain can be further delineated between physical or mental pain. Verse 5, where it says our transgressions, the word there is pisha. It means transgression, trespass, sin, or rebellion. And then lastly is the word iniquities. It's avon in Hebrew. This is perversity, depravity, iniquity, guilt or punishment of iniquity. In essence, Jesus can bear just about anything bad that can happen to you. And I shouldn't say just about. Everything bad that can happen to you, he is capable of bearing. Those things, all of those things I described, are things that rob us of our peace. And so the chastisement of our peace was upon him. That word chastisement means the discipline, the chastening, the correction for our peace was on him, and by his stripes we are healed. In other words, because it's on him, it doesn't have to be on you. Ever. He has carried those things away. If we look at the word healed in verse 5, this is the Hebrew word rapha. It appears 67 times in the Old Testament. 57 times or in 85% of the context it is used, it means to heal or to make healthful. Five times it means physician. One time it means cured. One time it means repaired. And three times it has a miscellaneous usage. But it means to mend, 
to cure, to heal, to cause to be healed, to repair, or to make whole. These things in these verses are ours, not his. It was our griefs. It was our sorrows. It was our transgressions. It was our iniquities, and it was the chastisement of our peace. But all of those things find their resolution in the atonement. Now, a lot of times in the cessationist camp, you don't like to hear them. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't believe in healing taking place today. They don't like the idea when healing is tied to these verses about Christ's atonement because the word atonement doesn't appear in these verses. The word atonement is pretty common throughout the Old Testament, but it doesn't appear in Isaiah 53. So one of the things that they argue is that atonement is only tied to sin. And they say that it's not genuine to tie the atonement of Christ to these verses in regards to healing. But I think if you look at the plain reading of these verses and the meaning behind those words, you can plainly see that that's what's being talked about, is healing. It's more than sin. And just the other couple of points. Number one, you can plainly see that it's talking about more than sin. Number two, the Bible doesn't mince words when it comes to tying sin and sickness together. Even in Jewish texts, like the Mishnah and the Talmud, there's an absolute conviction there that sin is the root cause of illness. Now, Am I saying, does that mean that all sickness is tied to sin? No, that's not what I'm saying. We live in natural bodies, suffering from natural decay, and sometimes things just break down, right? Some of us are getting old. Not all of us. Some of you are glowing quite radiantly out there. I am getting older, and there's some things that are just breaking down. But I am willing to say that there's a more of a correlation between sin and sickness than we are willing to admit. Number three, the idea of atonement is not exclusive to sin only. If you read the book of Leviticus, and I know that most of the people here love Leviticus, I can tell. But if we read Leviticus, intentional sin required an atonement. Yes or no? What about unintentional sin? Yes. I often speak about the law of first mentions when I teach on healing. Who does not know what the law of first mentions is? Okay, thank you, bold people. There's a few of you that do not know what the law of first mentions. In theology, the law of first mention is the principle in the interpretation of Scripture that states that the first mention or occurrence of a subject in Scripture establishes an unchangeable pattern with that subject remaining unchanged in the mind of God throughout Scripture. All right? Breaking that down. In other words, the first time you see something that is the focus of a passage of Scripture, that establishes the model or the mode that remains the same throughout the rest of Scripture. I often use... Uh, it's Genesis 24, right? Uh, is that where Jacob has his dream? Uh, at Bethel, sees the ladder set up, says this is none other than the house of God, right? What do you see taking place in that situation in regards to the house of God? There's God's presence. He's telling Jacob, come up here where I am. There's angels ascending and descending up the ladder. There's communication, there's glory, right? That sets a model for what is expected at the house of God throughout the rest of Scripture. Okay? Who knows what the first mention of healing is in the Bible? 
Genesis chapter 20, the story of Abimelech. Abimelech has just taken Abraham's wife, Sarah. When he took Sarah, he did that in innocence. He asked Abram, hey, who's this fancy lady? Abe said, what? She's my sis. He said, I like that. Come with me, right? So he did it in innocence. God comes to Abimelech and says, what? I'm going to kill you and everybody in your house. So you touch that woman. Isn't that what he says? And Abimelech appeals to what? His innocence. Hey, God, you heard me. I asked the brother. He said it's his sister. Are you going to kill me being an innocent dude? And what's God say? No, I prevented you from doing something stupid so I wouldn't have to kill you. You go back and give her back to Abraham. You, that man's a prophet. You ask him to lay hands on you and pray for you, and you will be healed. That's the first mention of both prophet and healing in the Bible. Okay? So out of that first mention of healing, there are some important takeaways. Unintentional sin can cause disease. God heals disease. Other people can pray for you for healing of disease. There was also atonement in Leviticus for illness or diseases that were not considered sin. Let me give you some cliff notes from Leviticus. Beginning in Leviticus chapter 11, you begin to see the, all the instructions about what is clean and what is not clean. Eat this, don't eat that, have your vegetables, avoid the trans fats. Leviticus 12, there's the atonement required after a woman gives birth. Verse 1 and 2, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. Verse 6 and 7. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. And she shall be clean from the flow of her blood, this is the law for her who has, been, who has born a male or a female. So there's no sin involved there, but there still had atonement to be made for that situation. Leviticus 13, you have all those skin diseases, those very curious verses about, hey, is the sore open? Is it not open? Does it have a black hair? Does it have a white hair? And all that stuff, whatever all that means. <clears throat> and what you do about it. Uh, then in Leviticus 14, you got more atonement for skin diseases. There's even atonement for houses with mold in them, right? So the interesting thing when you study Leviticus is that skin diseases, bodily discharges, prolonged illnesses, all these kinds of things, atonement is prescribed for a lot of those conditions, some of them were tied to sin. Some of them were not tied to sin. But they had atonement procedures, if you will, and, and some of them did not have atonement procedures. So it's clear from Scripture that atonement in the Old Testament covered sin, it covered sickness, it covered illness, and it covered disease. It didn't just cover sin, as the cessationist might say. And between what is contained there in the law, in Leviticus, and what we see in Isaiah, you hear and see Jesus proclaim as he does his ministry. So I don't think that there's any argument that the, about what the atonement of Jesus actually secures for us, because it covers all that stuff. When you overcome that argument, then the cessationist is faced with the argument about healing or their point of view that healing doesn't take place. But that presents a problem for them because 
They say that healing has stopped, right? That's the crux of their argument. Certain things are over. What's fascinating about that position, at least from my perspective, is that would also have to imply that salvation has stopped. It's amazing to me that evangelicals will proudly proclaim out of one side of their mouth that salvation is still available for everyone today, but out of the other side of their mouth say that healing, which comes from the exact same verses on the atonement that they love to preach about, that part of the atonement is no longer available. Well, I have news for you. If God isn't doing one of those things anymore, he's not doing the other. Because he never changes. So if he stopped doing one of those things, he stopped doing the other thing too. And there's a bunch of people that are in a whole lot of trouble. The last thing I want to say about the atonement is that it was God's plan. Verse 10 of Isaiah 53. Yet it pleased who? The Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Not man, not Satan, not evil, not the Romans. This was the planned, ordained work of God himself. It was prophesied by Isaiah hundreds of years before it happened. The verse actually says that there was a measure of pleasure brought to see this accomplished. Why? Because it brought victory. It brought victory. The suffering of Jesus in and of itself was not pleasurable to God. But the fact that that he, in his suffering, would accomplish what God had foreordained for him to accomplish, that, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians, Christ was reconciling the world to himself. That part was very pleasing to God. Verse 11 of Isaiah 53 says, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus has no regrets about what he accomplished or the way in which he had to go about accomplishing it. Every bit of that suffering and agony he endured was worth it. Now, I want to cover one last point. We recently had someone decline to join the church because of this statement of belief in part. And their position was, if Jesus provided for healing in the atonement, and we don't see healing manifested in our bodies, that it's due to a lack of unbelief or faith on our part. And I declined to agree with that perspective. I believe that's one of the most damaging and hurtful things you can say to someone. You don't get to blame people when healing doesn't manifest. I have no reservations about the efficacy of Jesus' atonement in terms of sickness and disease. We cannot fathom just how complete his atonement is. It is way beyond what we think we can grasp. So what I'm trying to say is there's no, in terms of capability, there is no shortcoming on his part. But when you say that, people then say, okay, well then there must be shortcoming on our part if healing isn't manifested. I don't agree with that. If that was the only criteria involved, that there was his part and our part, then maybe that would be a sound argument. But I don't think that that's the only factor in healing. I don't know why the Lord heals some and not others. You would have to explain this situation to me. Jesus walks into Solomon's porch, Solomon's portico, where the scripture says there was a great multitude of invalids. And he makes his way through the crowd 
heals one guy and turns around and leaves. It's not a capability question. There were potentially thousands of people there that were in that same condition as the guy that he healed that needed to be healed. But Jesus healed one man. The fact is, there's an element of mystery to healing. I'll give you another example. Jesus walked by the man at the gate beautiful dozens of times and never healed him. Now, Peter and John later come by the same guy, and they heal him. Why? Who knows? All we can do is theorize. But all we have is theory. Perhaps the man's healing got the Lord more glory when Peter and John did it. Perhaps God knew that it would generate persecution of his brand new apostles and his brand new church, and he wanted a little catalyst for those young fledglings. Perhaps the Lord wasn't ready to heal that man until Peter and John walked by. Perhaps the faith of Peter and John spurned God to action. Here's a dangerous one. Perhaps Peter and John were learning to walk in this new authority they had, and it was their choice that brought healing to that man. Ooh. Ooh. Here's one. Perhaps the man himself wasn't ready to be healed every time Jesus walked by. You know, it's curious to me. Every time sick people, not every time, but a lot of times sick people came to Jesus, what was his first question? Do you want to be healed? Obviously, there's an implication that you can not want to be healed. So it always is fascinating to me that the Lord wanted to verify where people were at in their own hearts first before he did anything for them. So maybe this guy wasn't ready. But by the time Peter and John came about, maybe he'd had a change of heart. Maybe he'd finally said, you know what? I'm sick of this. Lord, if you'd be willing, I'd like to be healed. I'm tired of laying here for 38 years. The point is, we don't know. I just gave you six different, very plausible reasons why that guy was not healed until that moment. So even though healing is paid for, that never means healing is guaranteed. At the end of the day, we're not in a position to make the judgment on what happens or what doesn't happen. And it's further not our role or our responsibility to explain anything away. God asks us to be disciples. He asks us to lay hands on people and pray for them. The same way he told Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20, the same way Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 28, the same way we do it today. We have to do our part. We lay our hands on, we pray, we petition the Lord. The results are always up to God. And people always take it as defeat when healing doesn't happen according to their preconceived notion of how it should happen, especially when there's a timeline involved. But the question I always have is, what is God's perspective? We've got to stop judging God by our expectations. We need to live from his perspective. And his perspective needs to be good enough of an answer, even when there's no answer. But under no circumstances do I condone blaming people or blaming a lack of faith or blaming sin or saying something else stupid that hurts people. Jesus didn't walk around Solomon's porch and say, see, if the rest of you losers were like that guy, I'd heal you too. Is that what he said? 
No. He said, I only do what my father tells me to do. And I only say what my father tells me to say. He slipped in, he slipped out. No more, no less. We should be likewise. Amen? Questions on the atonement? Praise God. <laughs>